All right. Looks like we're starting with Caitlin with uh, China Link Group to Red Echo. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, my name is Caitlin. Um, I am looking at this article uh, put out by Recorded Future. Uh, it's a PDF um, going over how uh, China is specifically targeting Indian power plants. And what's scary about this is that there's very little economic benefits uh, to doing this. This is purely a sort of military operation targeting civilian infrastructure. And this is sort of everyone's worst nightmares about hacking. I mean, it's one thing if, you know, China wants to go out and they want to steal, you know, data from a private company so they can, you know, make their own competing products. I mean, that's scummy and they shouldn't do it. Uh, but when you start hacking things like power plants um, and infrastructures that could take an entire country offline, um, you know, and give another country a military advantage, it, it becomes very scary. Um, and they seem to be very prolific. This is a, a high level, you know, APT uh, operation. Um, and they apparently, yeah, Red Echo got uh, uh, all over India's um, power grid. So did they take down the power grid then? They have not taken it down hmm. as far as I know. Um, however, um, like I said, they did get around. Um, and there, there's a bunch of, um, there's an article here, I'm sure it'll be linked somewhere <laughs> um, oh, on Sam's page, uh, going over the mitigations that you can do and uh, uh, in indicators of compromise uh, for this attack. One thing I've heard people say is that um, although the Chinese hack us constantly, they don't usually directly do damage because they don't actually want to shut us down. They just want to steal our secrets, our, our technological secrets. Right. But it sounds like they're more hostile towards India. Right, exactly. Uh, that's exactly what I was getting at. So, like I said, it's, it's one thing if they're just trying to steal secrets. It's another thing it, when they are actively targeting systems that could cause real human loss of life. Yeah, and that's what I wondered. But they haven't even done that to India yet, because Russia has certainly done that. Russia has done it. And now China is apparently getting in on the, on the act of, of going after India. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so, Alan, oh, Alexa Skills. Yeah, let's hear about Alexa skills. Yes, Alexa skills, which are apparently like programs that you can run on Alexa. Uh, you have to excuse me. I don't really know the Alexa ecosystem because I don't use it and never will. But at any rate, it turns out that you can run these what are called skills that are like little programs or applications on your Alexa system. And they can respond to certain phrases that you say and do certain things for you. And uh, there are a number of these Alexa skills on the Amazon marketplace, 90,000 plus. And it seems that nobody's done a comprehensive security uh, analysis of these skills and their capabilities until now. A half dozen researchers at North Carolina State and a university in Germany, the name of which I've forgotten, have uh, collaborated on this study and they've even come up with a website called alexaskillanalysis.org taking a look at how the Alexa skill works. And as it turns out, how easy it is for malicious developers to slip in um, either malicious actions or to change the uh, otherwise good skills into bad skills. Some of the highlights include the ability to claim that you are from any organization as a, as a developer, to claim that you are from any organization that you want. So I could create a skill and claim to be from Amazon, working for Amazon, and the skill marketplace would accept that. Uh, and another problem is that uh, even if one of these skills that is uploaded and incidentally automatically tested by Amazon is perfectly benign at first, it is possible for a malicious developer to then go back into their previously uploaded and submitted skill and change the code so that it then operates very differently. Now, obviously there are some potentially serious security ramifications, but according to the researchers, there does not appear to have been any widespread uh, attacks or uh, manipulation of these skill vulnerabilities in the wild. So at this point, it is more academic than anything. But now that the word is out, 
entirely reasonable to expect that some malicious actors will try to uh, leverage these vulnerabilities. Wow, it seems like maybe I should get one. This sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, and they're really cheap too. Just to hack it, because yeah, I've heard about these, it. and yeah. I do a lot of Android apps, and this sounds like even stupider than Android apps. Yes, and anyone can publish these skills. So, and you don't even really need an uh, Echo device. Uh, on their website, they show you uh, the, the I, I guess it's an IDE for the skills. Uh, and it looks very simple, actually, remarkably simple. So it's not hard for anybody to get, get in on this game. I think I'm going to have one by next week. This sounds irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then all oh, that. So I, this one was all over the news. Uh, the CPAC, all over the online news, although not the mainstream news. Uh, so the CPAC stage has this strange shape like a diamond with some lines coming off it. And it is the official symbol of the American Nazi Party. The American Nazi Party figured out a couple of years ago that the swastika is a bad brand for them. So they switched to a secondary Nazi symbol, which is what they have as the stage of CPAC. It's this weird shape, not a normal shape for a stage at all, but so that the uh, picture of Donald Trump and all the others will make it extremely clear to all the Nazis and his supporters that they are very much on board with them and, and that they are right at the center of the Republican Party, which is something that until recently they tried to make a little less obvious. And I remember specifically talking to one of my students six years ago and saying, oh, there are Nazis in America, but there's only 1% or less of them and they'll never win any offices or anything and we don't have to worry about them. And it is emphatically not true. It appears that the Republican Party is one inch from just openly admitting that they're run by the Nazis, which has been kind of true in fact, but they used to have to pretend it wasn't true and make it slightly less obvious. And I was impressed on the Sunday news program to hear Chris Christie angrily explaining that the Republicans are not Nazis. And when you have to actually openly deny it, that's kind of the last step before you might as well admit it's true. So anyway, I was, I was impressed by this and I guess it doesn't hit the mainstream because they feel like they can say, oh, that was just an arbitrary design choice just by accident. Nobody noticed that. But uh, anyway, right. yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. And this is how you do it. We do we you want to let someone in that you can't quite openly admit you do it with dog whistles like uh, Proud Boys stand back and stand by. They got the message very clearly. <laughs> but you can pretend you didn't mean that when it comes to court. So anyway, um, my, my Republican friends or my ex-Republican friends tell me not to worry the way I do that Trump will get back in because enough Republicans have had enough of this that he can't win again. And I hope they're right, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Everybody said he couldn't get in the first time either. Yes, they did. And I said that too. I said, no one could possibly really elect this guy. I said the same wrong. thing. Oh, it's just a publicity stunt. It'll never happen. Apparently, that's what Trump thought. They said he didn't expect to win. It was just a publicity stunt. He could never possibly win. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he wanted to be president, at least at first. Oh, now he's found out how much money you can make. Well, and I mean, I had to laugh at the picture of people toting around the, the literal golden idol. Of Trump. <laughs> well, uh, you know, a yeah. statue of him, that, that's like the least offensive thing he's done as far as I'm concerned, but yeah. yeah. I know the, the whole thing about that statue and for people at home that don't know what we're talking about. So at CPAC, they had a full golden statue of, of, of Donald Trump, you know, wheeled around. And if I saw that in like a book, if that were a fiction, I would say, Hey, you got to cut that out. That's just too on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There it was. yeah. But you know, a, a statue to a president, that's like not outrageous or unprecedented or anything. <laughs> Like I said, that's, that's the least objectionable thing he's done, in my opinion. But anyway, so there's a new jail breakout anyway. Elizabeth's got that. Yes. All the all the jail breaking, jail breaking all of the things here. So, uh, and this isn't the same uh, crew that did the last one, I don't believe. This is a, a new one um, that came out uh, over the weekend. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm going to have to try it. Yeah. I think two new ones have just come out. So, because mm -hmm. uh, I know the one that uh, that Axiom X made only worked up through an iPhone 10, but these new ones work all the way up to the latest iPhone. 
Yeah, which is uh, pretty wild. Um, oh, yeah. Considering, uh, and uh, yeah, it'll, it's pretty. It's yeah, it'll be fun to try. Well, I'm I'm drowning in iPhones. So I bought a pile of them to loan to students, and I've got extras, so I can totally practice all these jailbreaks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, decentralized naming. Let's hear about this one, Irvin. I've been hearing about uh, this kind of thing for years. So uh, this is an experiment of using blockchain to do DNS. Uh, for top level domains and also for certificate authorities. I don't know how I feel about this. It's an interesting attempt to get around using things like Google and Cloudflare for your DNS and just having it all done on, on blockchain. Uh, I don't know how many people are using it or how, uh, how stable it is. But, you know, of course, in, in all the text that they have here, they're talking about how great it is. Well, it'd be kind of fun to turn it on just to see it go with the handshake protocol. I know I heard a lot about this about seven years ago when the United States recording industry decided that anybody that uses DNS is therefore subject to American copyright laws. So if you're in France and you download something that's legal in France, the Americans will still prosecute you. That was when people said, you know, why does America control DNS? Why don't we have some kind of distributed DNS that doesn't live in one nation if they're going to be like that? But then we didn't do that again. So I think the motivation for a decentralized DNS is not so big anymore. Yeah, so this, this project is trying to do that. Well, it, is, it, it is an experiment sense. right now. The United States really is in a privileged position on the internet of controlling DNS, which is the heart of the whole thing. So in a logical sense, I can see how they would want to distribute it away from us. I'm kind of surprised the, they didn't or haven't. Well, there's no real pressure to put in all that work unless we are really, really, really annoying. <laughs> which we were being at one time. <laughs> well, you we haven't been for the last four years. That's interesting. No, not really. I don't I haven't heard of the RIA doing so many awful things for the last few years. Yeah, yeah interesting. Using coin, uh, using Bitcoins to, to do DNS and top level domains and whatnot. Yeah. Well, it, it's definitely with an experiment one day. Sure. It might be fun to set up. Like we did try that new thing in Brave where it has some kind of decentralized file sharing. Yep. Yep. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah. All right. And then we got Caitlin with, oh, this proctoring software that everybody hates. Yes. So uh, th there's this proctoring software called um, Proctorio. And it's, it's terrible. Everyone hates it. Um, and so this article is from Vice uh, titled, Schools are Abandoning Invasive Proctoring Software After Student Backlash. Uh, the article starts off by talking to Aloha Sargent, who works in the library over at Cabrillo College. Um, and apparently this proctoring software is so unpopular that there's this massive sort of wave of people trying to get it out of the system, uh, out of their colleges. Uh, so Cabrillo is one of the first colleges not to renew their, their proctorial software. I mean, it's no longer going to be used at Cabrillo and other, hopefully other uh, colleges will follow suit. Um, and basically what it does is it monitors your behavior and then uses AI to look for abnormal behavior. But as we know, AI tends to be both racist and ableist uh, because it, the samples it uses are, you know, ableist and racist. <laughs> um, and uh, so you have this system that basically uh, you know, discriminates um, against vulnerable students in a way that is uh, not only institutionalized, uh, but technologicalized as well, which is, you know, not a good thing, obviously. And uh, on, a, on, another, on a more personal note, just having these cameras on you all the time, looking for anything that you might be cheating, you know, just like scrutinizing every little behavior has caused a lot of students to break down and cry during tests. Um, and so there's a quote in this article uh, that really sums it up. Um, it's racist, it's ableist, it's an invasion of privacy and it creates a culture of suspicion and it harms students, so. Yeah, and also you get, then you get sometimes faculty members who rely on this and are just, do, do just totally crazy things. Uh, there was a, uh, email from a professor floating around the internet a few months ago um, that were saying, um, oh, you can't wear head coverings uh, for males or females. You're not allowed. 
uh, a lot of head and eye movements for a short time period. A student in six minutes had 776 head and eye movements. Another student had 624 head and eye student head and eye movements within 20 minutes, and that's an indication that you're cheating because you're not looking at the screen, and uh, you better shape up, or I'm just gonna flunk everybody. I mean, you know. <laughs> just just really really out of out of hand uh with some of that stuff so it's great to see that there's pushback against it and that there are schools that are um saying enough's enough we're not going to allow this there are so many of these programs that rely on these high stakes tests where it really really matters so people really have to cheat or they feel like they have to cheat and uh i i don't know i'd like to see things designed in a better way where you don't yeah. trust Ethos, uh, I, I mean, I like your ethos that, you know, you make assignments and homework that people want to do. So then they learn something from it. They don't feel compelled to cheat. I mean, that seems like the simplest and easiest way to me. Uh, but I mean, it's like those, it's like the plagiarism checkers, which I've gone off about before, uh, like turn it in, um, where, it, I mean, they're just so poorly built and faculty will rely on this stuff like it's gospel, uh, not realizing that they're just using a totally crap broken product. And, and I mean, it's really, I think it's pretty egregious, especially considering how much college costs now. Um, I mean, the costs are just obscene and you know, you're really ruining, you, you really have the power to ruin somebody's life. Uh, over a lot of times over nothing. Uh, you know, something I, I found in um, Turnitin is that it would flag uh, properly quoted and cited material uh, that you've got references and, and proper citations for and everything, it, it would flag that as plagiarism. I mean, that's nuts. Well, you know, there are programs based on this like nursing and law where there's this all important test that really will determine your whole future. And uh, it doesn't seem like that's going to change anytime soon, but it seems to me like the whole concept is highly questionable. I don't think the result is that nurses and law and lawyers are so perfectly prepared. I'm just thinking about Donald Trump's impeachment lawyers, like watching these guys pass the law exam and they don't seem to know anything about anything. So this idea that having this incredibly difficult, ruthless test where you absolutely eliminate all cheating will mean a high quality result. I'm not convinced. Well, we've seen that in tech and IT. We've all encountered somebody who's got an alphabet soup uh, of certifications after their name and see apparently no practical uh, knowledge or experience. I mean, yeah. there is a disconnect between those two. And I think like, you know, the other thing that comes up with me, for me with students is um, this stuff isn't just used in colleges, it's used in high schools and stuff too, where your students are a captive audience. They can't just say, well, nuts to this. I'm gonna take my tuition dollars elsewhere. They're stuck there. And I would think that there would be, especially with proctoring software like this, I think there'd be some major, um, student privacy uh, violations. I think there's some disruption headed in education. I think a bunch of it is still left over from a couple centuries ago when it was really just memorizing Latin in church and has just pointless rituals going on that no longer really suit the modern world. Like taxi cabs and uh, post offices, I think there's going to be a alter technical alternative that will change it. But in the meantime, we have these technological rituals that are also useless like Proctorio, and they're certainly not helping education. In fact, it's even worse than the orthodox education that we got before. Well, it's it's a lousy technical attempt to, to reproduce the old high stakes face-to-face -face test. Yeah. And you know, anyway. I failed at it. So, yeah, I would like to see like a CTF problem you have to solve. I know um, they do that at one of the companies that hires our students for pen testers, NCC. Mm -hmm. The, um, the application is a pen test. You have to solve, do the pen test on this, this uh, CTF problem to show that you know stuff. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense for a pen test company. However, there is no simple solution for writing a history paper, for example, that still needs to be done manually. Or yeah. taking, what is it? taking a, a GMAT test online. Yeah. Sure, I'll take the special. 
Two. I think we're getting. I guess. Are you ordering for all of us? Oh, I guess I'll, I'll do the. Um, I'll take the um, one order of tacos. This is three pieces. Can I get some fries with that? Oh, this one is order of order. tacos. Taco time. I don't know. Just I, I think it's. Three. All right. Well. I think Kirk made it. I, I, I was not expecting that. <laughs> yes. Is that Kirk? <laughs> yeah. no, that what a great way for Kirk to be introduced to it the is, it is. world. That's the legendary Kirk. We wondered when Kirk was going to make it. Anyway. <laughs> uh, 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 so before we move to the next article, um, I should note that, that I myself have a condition uh, with my eyes called uh, congenital nystagmus, which means that I can't control if my eyes go back and forth. Uh, so it would be really interesting for me to use that Proctorio software and just see how much it thinks I am cheating versus how much I'm actually cheating, which is usually a lot, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. In your case, I'm not sure I'd call them false positives. Yeah, I, I might get, I, I, I'd probably be ranked even higher than, uh, than what I'd normally be ranked. All right. <laughs> well, anyway, then we got a ransomware jet maker. Yes. I talked last week about this ransomware group that was responsible for hacking Jones Day, the law firm that represented Donald J. Trump. And they're at it again. Uh, but we have some more background information. So what's happened is that the Canadian business jet manufacturer Bombardier has been hacked and a number of their files, including apparently some design files, have been leaked onto the dark web. And this is courtesy of the very same group or groups that were responsible for Jones Day. And so of course, naturally, there's been a lot of consternation about, well, Bombardier, they're making military aircraft and if this is a very serious problem, et cetera, et cetera, probably not. Uh, it seems like the MO of this group, which was formerly identified as the CLOP ransomware group, but may actually be a different group called UNC 2546, I believe. Um, they're not even bothering with ransomware. They're just doing um, some shaming of companies and they're trying to extort money prior to dumping. And if they don't get their money, then they go ahead and dump. But anyway, in the case of Bombardier, I don't think it's that serious a problem because that company is going down the tubes anyway. And they used to manufacture quite a number of different products, but now they're down to just a handful of business jets that probably aren't going to sell very well much longer. So not really a big deal. The backstory is more interesting because it turns out that all of these companies that have gotten hacked were using the same product, Excellion FTA, which stands for File Transfer Appliance, which makes it sound really high tech and cloud, but it's actually a 20 year old product. Um, and it had uh, four different zero days that were being exploited. Um, and uh, uh, apparently none of the victims uh, were, uh, uh, had any of their files encrypted. So it's just a pure um, uh, blackmail dump scheme. So what does this stuff do? It sounds like a cheap imitation of Dropbox. Well, yeah, you know, that's what I was thinking. They yeah. should just set up some FTP servers or just upload everything to mega upload and yeah. <laughs> just as good, if not better than Excel on FTA. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the deal is. I think a lot of it's legacy. The product is set to uh, sunset in April of this year. So it's at the very tail end of its 20 year old life. Um, and I guess this UNC 2546 group very recently figured out this vulnerability and they tried to pull this basically shame and dump scam. And maybe they've gotten some takers. Maybe they have actually made some money on this. But it sounds like um, all in all, even though some of these firms are high profile, the data is not actually all that sensitive. So they just let it go. Hmm. Yeah, the thing they dumped was, it was interesting in that it was a uh, um, technology, plans for a technology that had been used on um, interesting things like the Globemaster, the spy plane and stuff like that. But it was also old and obsolete tech that was past its end of life. So it wasn't really a very high stakes dump for the company. 
Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding too. And I, I'm tempted to go and look at this onion site where they've dumped all this data and, and take a closer look at it. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, that always makes me nervous. And it is of course illegal to possess these things. So maybe I shouldn't discuss it publicly. Well, I don't, I don't really think the legal risk is significant, but you might want to do it on like a Linux machine or something in case there's- Well, I, if I were to do it, I would not announce it publicly on this forum. Let's oh, see. I've done it plenty. I, I used to crack. I, I remember when I took the dumps and I cooked them to class the next day and I had military students. I did not know it was illegal to crack the stolen military hash passwords. It wasn't until like a year later, somebody said that's illegal. I said, it is? How can that be illegal? That's the thing. You try to obey the law, but the law is so irritating. It's you, you end up being in trouble when you didn't do anything that seemed wrong. Well, yeah. I'm going to err on the side of not getting in trouble. This. What? I'm just going to err on the side of not getting in trouble by not doing anything potentially incriminating in the first place. You can try that, but it turns out to be really hard. <laughs> anyway, um, so this I thought is pretty awesome. A crowdsourced firewall, CrowdSec, a multiplayer firewall. So this is like Google spam filter. You, as soon as somebody else notices this IP doing something bad, it percolates over to you and your firewall blocks it. So hopefully you can use crowdsourcing to stop attacks. And they claim it's like faster than competing products and such and free and distributed. So we'll see. This is kind of what Cloudflare does. So anyway, um, it sounds kind of like fun. Also, the first thing I thought is, could you game it? by just sending false reports that these guys are evil when they aren't to like make other people shut them off. But uh, maybe they have some defense against that and maybe they don't. It, did it just get released? Yeah. Uh, I wonder if it can get gamed now. I, I mean, I know on my open sense firewall, um, like I, I'll download rules every week or so, um, you know, just going over the, the known IPs that are sending out bad traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess this is the same thing, just updated more frequently, like every hour or so. Yeah. Okay. The idea is it can, they say it can respond to a DDoS within five minutes. So maybe it's updated really fast. Anyway. Oh. And then Apple's walled garden. Yeah. So I thought this was interesting. Um, the, uh, it, it, the, Author uh, made the case for um, the fact that the, the the way that the Apple ecosystem set up uh, makes it harder for um, attackers to uh, get inside the systems. However, uh, once they're in there, um, that security makes them harder to to spot and root out. Um, uh, in, in, in that they, um, they can't really see what's going on at the system level. And because of that, um, this, uh, this threat hunter, um, posits that most of the attacks are, are going unnoticed. Well, yeah, I mean, like you can't put any virus or a firewall on your iPhone. They don't exist. Right. You can't put them on. And this is why I was so excited when check rain came out because you couldn't inspect the internal operations of an iPhone without it. Yeah, um, so I thought that's I thought that's kind of interesting, and he even had a good example where uh, security features on the phone killed a jailbreak tool that he was using to to look in there, and um, it locked him out of private areas of the phone, um, including an update folder. But that's where the attackers were hiding. <laughs> so um, double-edged sword. So I, I just thought this was interesting. Um, you know, I, it was not something that I had really considered it from this perspective before, but it makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, I think there's a very similar issue in the jailbreak community. Actually, MX tweeted it out just today. There's like two or three jailbreaks, but they're secret and closed source. And he said, you know, we do keep the jailbreaks closed source for this reason, because we have a competent team of experts that can improve them. And we don't really need everybody knowing how we do this. So there's secrecy in the... Uh, you know, independent jailbreak community too. There's a lot of security through obscurity in the Apple ecosystem. And uh, so Urban gonna make Grand Theft Auto load faster. 
Uh, so this one is more for our, our students who are gamers mm -hmm. and may complain about slow loading times when they have a, a should have a fully working system and wondering why things are running slow. Mm -hmm. Here's an example of reverse engineering and uh, using the knowledge that we teach in our classes to use to helping you out with games. 15 uh, minutes and, just to boot up? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, apparently it does some some weird thing where it loads a JSON file that's huge and, and goes through it every single time instead of just cutting through the madness and removing any duplicates and you know, just going straight at it. Wow. And uh, they have an example of what to do. And this, this is just one of many ways that you can use the knowledge that we teach in your everyday life. Yeah, you know, yeah. Usually this is the reverse. Um, usually people start off by hacking video games and cheating in video games and then moving those tools over to offensive or defensive security. Yep. But you can hack them to make them better. Yep. Yes, you can. So how much faster did he make it? Uh, he made it at the end. They made it significantly faster. It went with, with, the, with both issues past a minute 50. A minute 50 instead of 15 minutes. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think uh, some game developer studios should be hiring some people, some infosec people, to be working on their mainstream product. Mm -hmm. I think Google did the same thing about 10, 15 years ago. They noticed how slow JavaScript was in Internet Explorer, and they said, "Hey, this engine is no good," and they made it 100 times faster. And that led to the whole world of all these JavaScript-based web platforms, which could were not possible. So it's it's good to see in that regard. Yep. Yeah, it reminds me of this one project. Uh, so I, there's this old game, I think, for the Super Nintendo. It's something like Gradius or, you know, it's one of those space shooters, you know. And so what someone did is that there's a bunch of slowdown in this in this old Super Nintendo game. So they went in and they ROM hacked it. And not only did they ROM hack it, what they did is they essentially edited the ROM file to say there's all these extra chips that are supposed to be in the ROM and then went in and like redid all the code for all these sections to make use of these extra chips and like completely spit up the game. <laughs> like there's a lot of stuff you can do, uh, you know, to, to improve games that the original developers either couldn't or didn't know how to do. Yeah. And then we got graphene noro, nano origami. Nano origami. Yes, I just love the, the name of this article. Um, I don't know the name of the, I, I don't know these people that posted this. It's uh, called Singularity Hub. Uh, that name does not inspire a whole lot of confidence. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, they read an article, they wrote an article called Graphene Nano Origami Could Take Us Past uh, the End of Moore's Law. Uh, and they, they do link to an actual uh, study that I can't get access to because apparently you need to pay lots of money. It's a walled garden type, you know deal but and there's no way past those no way past those of course not <laughs> uh but uh, uh so the idea is that you know we're getting to the end of, of sort of silicon's usefulness right so for people that that aren't aware how silicon chips work uh silicon itself is basically just glass uh literally i mean when you when you buy a mirror you buy a piece of glass you're just buying silicon uh so to make it useful you we have to do something to that silicon um, and it's known as something called a quote unquote semiconductor in scare quotes. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what, basically what we do are, or what engineers do, I don't do this myself, I'm not that cool. Uh, they, they take other elements and they mix it in with the silicon in order to like change its properties a little bit. So I believe it's like phosphorus and boron usually to, to give it an extra electron or take an electron away. And then you can use that to you know create different layers of silicon, like sandwich them together and make transistors and stuff. It's really cool. Um, and so the same thing is true of graphene, right? We, you can make graphene, but graphene alone isn't going to do any wonders or make any chips. Um, and so what this new uh, study does is look at, looks at the way you can deform the graphene in order to change the properties of the graphene. So you, instead of doping it with something else, you can just you know dent it essentially, uh, and turn it into you know different properties uh, and give it different properties that you can use to then create a transistor, which I think is really cool. Um, and so there's a new term uh, for this kind of study. Uh, I think it's called straintronics. Uh, I believe yes. Uh, yeah, so it's the, the quote from the article is this, uh, the work falls into an emerging line of research known as straintronics, which is uncovering the surprising ways in which me mechanical strains in nanomaterials uh, can dramatically change their electronic, magnetic, and even optical characteristics. 
So look forward to that in the future. No, it makes a lot of sense. So you, you design a printed circuit by folding the material instead of by having layers of semiconductor the way we do now with the photoelectronics. Yes, um, it would be really interesting to see how fragile these are though. Um, I mean, silicon itself is already pretty fragile, but it, you can still kind of layer it and you know put it in epoxy and it it's, doesn't bend anyway, it's just flat sheets. This looks like uh, it might be more fragile. So we'll see where this goes. It's, it's begging for the application of an atomic force microscope to adjust it, but yeah, it, it, it's cool. A lot of people take the Singularity Institute seriously. Other people think they're a crazy cult, if that's who this is and it looks like it. Yeah, it is the Singularity University, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I Like I said, the, the name doesn't inspire a whole lot of trust. No, a lot of super famous people really like it, like Ted. Other people think they're crazy. It's by that one guy that thinks he's going to live forever by taking about 100 supplements a day. He's, yeah, he's yeah. expecting to live long enough to get like a robot brain and live forever. Yeah, I mean, I assume it's a, fut a futurism yeah. type type sites and a lot of futurism is a little wacky yeah it's like like everything elon musk does like you know the real people that make these silicon valley companies they the billionaires they tend to be kind of nuts they exist on a different plane than the rest of us and oh, or they have access to better drugs than we do that could very well be a lot of it <laughs> that's often the way it works so Fry's is gone. Yeah, Fry's Electronics, after an extended morbid period, has finally called it quits. And, um, you know, this, this was not part of my childhood, but I understand that it was an important part of many people's childhoods and uh, or adult lives. And uh, for those who have never uh, been to a Fry's Electronics store, they were like theme parks, but uh, electronic store theme parks. So far more interesting than a Best Buy or a Micro Center. But um, for the past several years, they were clearly in distress. And um, the last time I was in a fry several years ago, it already looked like the chain was out of business or very nearly so. They had uh, barely any stock and uh, it, was, it was pretty sad. But they managed to keep going for quite a long time. Um, but uh, now it's finally over. And so there are many obituaries from sentimental tech writers uh, going on about uh, how Fry's Electronics is gone. And this is the end of an era in brick and mortar electronics retail. And it, I guess it really is because although Best Buy and Micro Center are still around, um, there's no knowing how much longer they will survive. Uh, everything seems to have gone online and uh, Amazon's captured most of that. So, uh, yeah, does it have any consequences for cybersecurity? No, not really, but it is the end of an era for electronics buying in and California. It is kind of a bummer because sometimes you need stuff right yeah. away. You don't have the time to wait for it to get there for two days or 10 days or whatever. Um, so it is kind of disappointing. I kind of hope we do get a micro center here in the Bay Area, but I can't see that being a sound business decision. Um, no. You know, my other, one of my other favorite spots, uh, Al Asher's in Berkeley closed um, finally, and uh, that was that was kind of sad because it was it was like going to a museum <laughs> and and uh, an electronics store. Uh, but I will say this: the last time I went by uh, Central Computers. Uh, and SF, they were doing a booming business. So I think there may be, there may still be a market for this stuff, but it's got to be a hard, um, it's got to be hard to cover your operating costs and make it into a profitable, profitable thing when you're competing with um, so many uh, online retailers. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Central Computers. I forgot about that. Yeah, they, I, I really hope that they succeed too, or they, they prosper. Although every time I go in there, I'm struck by how much of their inventory is taken up by just cables, cables yeah. and adapters. Yeah. And that seems like a pretty low margin product. So, uh, and they've got some very expensive uh, uh, storefronts. So I, I, I'm not sure. I, I wish them the best, but I, I can't be terribly optimistic about them either. Yeah. 
All right, and then Gab got hacked uh, after Parler got hacked, and then went down. Gab is now the far right uh, place to go, and they got hacked through a SQL injection. And some group called Distributed Denial of Secrets says they have everything, all the passwords which were not encrypted for groups, the hashed passwords of individuals that were hashed. I don't Anyway, all the private messages, chats, and everything else. But they're not just dumping it publicly. They're trying to be, I guess, responsible by giving it careful to, to selected journalists and stuff. So we'll see what happens. But they got stuff from Donald Trump and from all the people that went to the January 6th event or uh, the insurrection and all that stuff. So uh, it may be of interest to the FBI and everything else if they can actually trust any of it, which is the problem. Hacked data usually doesn't work very well in court because it didn't really pass through trusted lines with a proper chain of custody. But anyway, we'll see what comes of it all. Um, well, and, you'd think that the FBI has already got a copy of all that data. Uh, well, the FBI, I don't think is allowed to perform illegal hacking to get the data. No, but they, they, could, they could subpoena them. They could, but I don't think the chat gab is committed a crime. I don't think they could get a search warrant or a court order to seize their data. Um, it would have to be limited to like only certain accounts where they have probable cause that they were involved in a January 6th insurrection or something. You know, that's why hackers usually take the action because the legal process is sort of slow and limited True. and just finding a SQL injection and dumping all the data is faster. But, uh, True. although if, if, uh, police can get warrants for raids pretty easily, I saw a, a report where it, uh, for some raids, it, the judge would look at the at the application for 30 seconds and approve it, they might be able to. Well, that's what I don't know. But but anyway, I guess we'll be hearing more about this. Um, a full 30 seconds. Wow. A full 30 seconds. Especially when it came to uh, neighborhoods of uh, minorities and underrepresented. Yep. I'm shocked to hear yeah. that. Yeah, well, I, I, this is often how, how much inspection things. I remember I surprised Liz by doing that. She was going to take one of my courses and she did all the homework and I looked at it for like 10 seconds. So I say, okay, you get an A. And she said, what? You don't need to look at it. I said, no, I don't need to look at it. I can already <laughs> tell that you know this stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, but you know, once you have tenure, you can afford to be a slob like that anyway. So, so Google says ASLR is over. Yeah. This is pretty cool, I thought. Um, so, uh, you know, I thought that we knew that ASLR was over. And did? it's I didn't. Nobody told me. Quite some time, but now <laughs> we've wait, wait, why is it over? And why was I supposed to know that? Um, I just thought that we it was, uh, we, we already knew uh, that we had uh, ways to uh, exploit that and override it. Like what? Uh, I don't know them, and I teach that class. I should know this. <laughs> okay, well, um, there are ways. So, um, yeah, um, and then they can be they can be defeated. Um, apparently, um, the specter. But specter and meltdown are not very practical. They're hardware dependent. Uh, I, I I I think that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say they, they are practical in the sense that the first um, uh, uh, Spectre and Meltdown uh, malware uh, like is actually starting to spread across the internet right now. Um, okay. I, that was another article I was thinking about posting. It just, I didn't realize it would come up. <laughs> well, they have a vulnerability. Uh, they, they have a vulnerability in their um, uh, garbage collector for their, um, their, uh, for Chromium, and uh, they realized that it's, it's likely that this could uh, it could be exploited, but they're just not going to fix it because uh, um, they've already got they've already got a plan in place. Apparently, so they they already knew that uh, that there that there were shortcomings that that could allow it to be exploited. So they uh, put a plan in place. Well, I'd like to know more. Yeah. Okay. It looks like they're talking particularly about JavaScript type browser exploits. Well, yeah, that was the the paper that came out. I don't know four years ago. Um, well, the I know you can overcome them with heap spraying. So, mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, good. 
And <coughs> is Soli Renz? Ah, yes. Soli Renz one, two, three. I think it is abhorrent that Solar Winds decided to blame an intern. Oh, That's yeah. where they shifted the blame. Rather than saying, you know what, we missed. We didn't, we didn't check our work. But instead, just pointed a scapegoat as a, uh, for an intern. That's horrible. Well, the other thing I like is they claim the intern did that in 2017, but the probably people found it in 2019. And when the Solar Winds hack occurred, all kinds of I saw hackers on my feed saying, I've been wandering through that stuff for years. Their password is solar wins one, two, three. Everybody knows that. So, I mean, you can't, at any time you blame it on a subordinate, that just indicates terrible management. Yeah. But, you know, it's part of fundamental management 101. You cannot outsource responsibility. You can only outsource work. If your employee did this stupid thing, then why did you hire an idiot for an employee and not train them and not supervise them and let them do it wrong? You still don't escape responsibility. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I, this seems like that uh, that FTP thing. Uh, you know, huge companies seem to rely on this third party crap that's terribly made and maintained without really noting it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's more really supply chain issues really require some more management. Yep. 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 All right. Well, I guess that's it for this one. So Sam, I'm I, I just love the fact that you are saying that management is solution is the solution to our problems. You are the last person I would expect to say that. <laughs> well, I, well, you know, this is why I outsourced the pen testing classes to Liz. I'm moving into management, and I was mostly because of the iPhone. I used to have no respect for administrative controls, but the iPhone is protected by administrative controls, and the end result is it's very good. So I began to have some respect for management, especially now. One thing I've been arguing about lately is if you understand management well enough, you know how to totally ignore everything they say with more, with more knowledge. But anyway. Well, Sam, I'd like to point out that City College is in desperate need of competent administrators. <laughs> well, now, you could have competent administrators, but if you did, then we probably would never get anything done because anybody competent would never have let me begin the security program. They'd no, say, no. Start with a hacking you... class, they'd say, oh, my God. You can't do that. The only reason I was able to do it is because there was no management. No, you, you, you're not following what I'm suggesting here. Yeah. I think, I think you have a future as oh, an administrator. No. Oh, no. I can <laughs> study management. And for Chancellor 2021. Yeah. No, 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 you, know, no, you know how a, a cat can look at a king. I can study management and analyze it. I could never perform it. I've tried it. I can't talk to any of those suit people for even one minute without offending them. They, you can't be worse than the previous two that we've had. Well, I think a stuffed penguin, penguin would be equal in that regard. But that's, I was, I have higher standards for my life than that, than being <laughs> better than the worst person on earth, you know. This reminds, me, this reminds me of the Lincoln Project, which is totally crashed and burned. I said, well, you know, you're taking the worst people on earth and putting them to work together because they found somebody even worse to hate for a while. And this really can't be stable for long. And indeed it wasn't. But, you know, I, I'd like to be a little bit better on my tombstone. I don't want them to say the second worst guy on earth, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, But yeah, we're up for yet another new chancellor and another new round of budget. Probably cuts. wouldn't meet the qualifications anyway, because you don't be embezzle money. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that the more polite term is yeah, I don't have management experience. See, that's the kind of comment I would make, which would not work. You know, that's why I can't be a manager. You have to cover everything with a layer of like cotton candy. And I oh. would, for, before long, I forget and I say the truth. So, Kirk, how are you doing? Good. I thought I crashed the party. I know. Yeah. We noticed <laughs> you came in with like pizza or tacos or something. <laughs> a legendary Kirk. I've heard a lot about you. Yeah. Well, you know, you guys forgot the liquidators for fries. You kept saying closure, but I'm waiting for the liquidators to come in and uh, just sell the stuff. That's what happened at Best Buy, if you forgot. Well, I say, I there's much left off. to liquidate. Yeah. I've seen the pictures, Kirk. There's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing left. Where did they move it all then? I think they sold it over the last couple of years. No, there was, before they closed it, there was inventory in the store the last time I went. Okay. Before the pandemic. Yeah, cheap perfume and bath bombs. <laughs> yeah. What about TVs? 
Last one I went to was one in uh, Palo Alto, and it was about empty. There, I, they had a trapper keeper on the shelves, a <laughs> dusty trapper keeper, which really surprised me. Taking it back to the 90s for school supplies, and uh, yes, the aforementioned cheap perfumes, and not a whole lot else. That's the one I hated. Well, I'm going to stop this one.